So a very warm welcome. We are at the EOI. We're in this IMSD, International Master in Sustainable Development. And within this framework, in this class, which has an uh, exciting variety of people, literally from a number of continents, uh, we're going to be enjoying this. Uh, it's a short course. And today, in specifically on the live streaming, we'll have uh, an introduction to CSR in small and medium enterprises. So uh, what, as, as per the other time, you will have a, uh, an exam at the end of this, uh, and the 20% of the marking will be on the usual blog post, 70% a short document on CSR and SME, and you will see the characteristics later, and then the 10% in terms of the interaction you will enjoy and uh, give lively in this, in this time. The good news is 23rd of April is our last class of three, so you'll have plenty of time to prepare that. There shouldn't be any problems with that, and we can go forward with that. So what can you expect from this course? What do we have uh, in store for you? Today, uh, definitions. You know my great uh, interest in definitions, and you will have some traditional definitions and new definitions of SMEs. How are SMEs evolving, have to evolve in this new market they're in? And what are the key success drivers that they're aiming for that really al need them uh, to allow to do things in a different way? Uh, the next lesson will be on Friday, which is about creating and, and measuring. That's a very important part. But we're not talking about CSR in general. We'll talk about the values that make CSR happen. So we'll go deeper into what really creates, uh, what inspires a, a, an SME to do a CSR project, and especially what is the leadership style that's required. And it's a new leadership style. It's your kind of leadership style that, that is required to allow this new CSR era to, to emerge. And <coughs> quite a long time after that, you'll have holidays and everything and relaxed. And you can see what works and what doesn't when applying CSR and SMEs. We'll see a number of case studies uh, that I've applied, that other people have applied. We can really have a good conversation about that. And as always, I, our own personal area of influence SMEs, I'm not sure how many of you will be working in SMEs, we'll find out. But it's very important to see what is our influence, what can we make happen within this uh, framework that is changing and challenging. And as always, if I have a couple of volunteers to present their case, their CSR and SME case, you're most welcome to make it a bit more lively. We had two great people last time, perhaps another couple if you want. You'll have about 15 minutes available at the end of the last class. Everything clear? Wonderful. Let's get started. So, what's the definition of a small and medium enterprise? How would you define it? Small but medium. Okay, that's one definition. Less than 200 employees. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to address it. Anything else within defining an SME? On the other side, there's another comment. Revenues, perfect. So we have a number of indicators we can use for that. Now what I'm going to use here is <coughs> the Commission, European Commission's official definition of an SME. And you can see it's not just an SME, we actually have three kinds of enterprises. And this will give you an idea <coughs> of the kind of enterprise that we'll be specifically focusing on. So what do we mean by SME? We mean medium-sized enterprises, which as you said, have uh, 250 empl employees or less. Their annual turnover should not exceed 40 million, and their annual balance sheet total, you have the figure there, of 27 million. Uh, when you go to small enterprises, between 10 and 49 employees, and, and this is the data in terms of turnover, in terms of balance sheet total, and the micro enterprises, excuse me, they say have basically fewer than 10 employees as a criteria. So as much as possible, we're focusing on what happens in these kind of areas. As always, we'll go and talk about many other areas as well, just to see that. But this is what we mean by SME. This is the focus of this specific uh, three-day three course. So there's no, uh, it's defined by the European Commission, so we'll go with that, and that's kind of interesting. Having said that, I do like new definitions of and new kinds of uh, enterprises that are, that are actually happening. This is an article that was written on CNBC Business in 2012, so already uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and it talks about a new kind of enterprise. It's called micro multinational. Uh, so in this case, they're talking about uh, these three really cool looking guys. They're Finnish, 
so in, in Finland and Brazil. The, the company is called Campalist. They do a social media ROI uh, marketing <coughs> kind of tools. So it is a micro enterprise of three people, but it's a, they call it a multinational, micro multinational. So they basically say they can set up anywhere. You know, the comment they make here is small is actually an asset, it's not a hindrance. It means you're able to respond very quickly to consumer, consumer needs. You can be agile without any of the bureaucracy. So I'm not sure how many of you have actually worked in SMEs. One, two, three, four. Okay, so quite a few of you. And so SMEs is a relatively small company. Do you find bureaucracy even in an SME or not? What's your general <coughs> outlook on that? How many f of you find it fairly bureaucratic or how many of you find it very agile? Agiles? Yeah, bureaucratics, one, okay, two. So it's interesting that within an SME, you say you should be leaner and faster and so forth, not necessarily so. What <coughs> we're looking for is really small, lean and efficient because as we keep saying, the world is changing very, very fast. So unless you adapt, you're really not gonna go anywhere. So for them, I love the way they open an office. How do they do it? They just fly off to, like, let's say, we want to open business in Brazil. And opening business in a new continent, new place, is as easy as flying there, finding a co-working space, and getting a desk. So it's no longer, we're going to set up an office there. We need to have a, you know, a representative office that looks good on the 20th floor or whatever. What they need is a place where they can work locally. And a co-working space is ideal, because what do they do? They land there, and they've got a marketing expert, they've got a financial expert, they've got salespeople. They can bring in people, local people, that can work for this micro company at very little additional cost. And, oh, they did mention Brazil. There we go. That's, uh, I knew there was there there. So in Richie, in a week, they can open shop in a new place. So today, uh, that's another thing that I think was interesting. Anna, you want a microphone and you have a question. I was just wondering how common co-working spaces are in Europe, uh, outside of Europe, because I've heard of it here, but if you're looking to expand into different areas and other continents, I figure it might be a bit tougher. It's, uh, I mean, the, t the uptake has been basically where there's lots of people, there's a condensed of people, that's where it happens. And it's going very, very fast all over the world. So it's not a just a local phenomenon to Europe or to the US or so forth. It's also a logic thing because of the cost involved and because of the collaboration you create. So I mentioned about social enterprise, the hub. The hub has a, a spread of uh, co-working spaces around the world. And it's interesting to see that also the co-working has been growing very fast. I mentioned that in Madrid there were three when we set up in 2010, now over 300. Very big increase. And this is a worldwide trend. So I guess the only criteria is whether there's a, enough population to make it worthwhile to have this or whether the cost of offices is too high. So it's, not, it's just a way of working as opposed to something completely new, which is really happening worldwide. So what I thought was interesting here was, I would, and Anna, as you have the microphone, you can read this one, so I stop with my voice, I have very little of it. Today's startup. Today's startups will never grow into conglomerates with a, a staff of 100,000. The traditional path is over. It's ineffective. Okay, so you remember what's a sign of success? We have now reached our 100,000 employee. That really sounded like a really cool thing to have, a really thing that you would aspire to. That is no longer efficient. When you go and work in SMEs or companies, you, even if you're in a corporation, you will try to split it up in smaller departments to make it efficient, effective, and adaptive. So that's really a part of the past. So question there, how many employees there's a company serving 1.11 billion people who use their sites each month, as of May 2003, actually have. What company could have 1.11 billion people visiting it and using it uh, on a monthly basis? What? Facebook. Facebook. There we go. No longer an SME with it. So how many employees does Facebook serve in 1.11 billion? 1.11 billion, okay? That's a customer base. How many employees, more or less? 200, uh, that's a bit optimistic. They actually have 3,500. But the ratio is astounding. 3,500 serving 1.1 billion people. So this gives you an idea. And to me, this goes into a bit more of a far-fetched land. WhatsApp was bought for a, for a whopping $19 billion. No comments about the value. This is definitely a, a small 
enterprise. It enjoys 420 million monthly users. And how many employees does it have? What did it have? It's closer to your figure. 55. 55 employees that uh, get 19 billion. Do you understand what we're getting at? Really think, rethink the concept of big in terms of big, hopefully responsible impact, big money, big everything, but definitely not a lot of employees. The world has changed, and we'll see that later. It's really about using people around your company uh, on projects as opposed to employing a lot of people that really sticks you down and makes you very slow and so forth. So this is one very important thing. Now, what are the characteristics of specific characteristics of an SME? Some of you have been working in SMEs, others might want to or will have or so forth. What do you think is specific about an SME? We talk about the size and the dimensions, but in terms of characteristics, anything specific that comes to mind? Um, I think there are also lower hierarchies. Lower so hierarchies. So many people okay. working there. So I'm going to write, even though we're going to see that, I think it's important that we start writing. So lower hierarchies. Um, I think there's a lot of multitasking, like people have to do lots of things because uh, they're less uh, work workers. So they're not so focused, they're more multitasked. You had a comment? Who had comments on this side? It's easier to communicate with people. Easier to communicate, yeah. Shorter decision making chain. Shorter decision making. Per actually, it's uh, you give me a lot more one than I actually had, so that's great. I always learn from these classes. So, and this is definitely what is it's interesting. No? It's a very interesting, specific kind of company organization that seems to be working very well now. The other thing is <coughs> they usually have an extensive local knowledge. They're very on the ground. They know their people, the customer better. It's a smaller, it's more informal. You get this kind of local knowledge, uh, resources, supply patterns, purchasing trends. <coughs> They're also a very important source of innovation. If you think about an SME, they generally specialize in niches uh, because they can do everything. They're reducing size and scope, so they're really specializing, really focusing, and then they become really innovators within that field. And that's why, for example, the Facebook buy out to these companies because they have specific innovation, specific know-how that they develop by just focusing, honing in, lasering into one kind of area. And another one is they're highly adaptable and fast changers. No? We mentioned how important that is, and we see that is definitely one of their characteristics. And they also draw upon the community of their for the workforce. They're very connected in the sense that a small enterprise, generally, at least in the old system, actually found their employees locally. Because it's small, you don't really go so far away. You find and you get to know the people there. And they provide goods and services tailored to local needs. Now, local, again, it's nice. We used to think about an, an NGO in a local uh, NGO, a small and medium enterprise in a local place, but things have changed a little bit. Uh, so there we are in Madrid, ready after this course to set up ideally a social enterprise, second best, a responsible uh, small and medium enterprise. So here you are in Madrid, and now you're looking for your employees, you're looking for your market, you're looking for the purchase where you can purchase things from and so forth. So in the past, just a few years ago, you would have looked at an area here, maybe also look for cl clients in Barcelona, Bilbao, but this is kind of your area, mainly for an SME, that's where you go for. But things have changed a lot since then, because we also interconnected, it's so easy to exchange and so forth. We saw that micro multinational, they set up shop in Brazil in just two weeks. This is just how local our market is. And they've also changed the map, usually uh, Europe is nicely at the middle, for obvious reasons, Asia, and China is now at the middle, so that's also a big change. If you think of purchasing from somewhere, instinctively, you will start to go to Asia. Now, as we know from Patagonia, they're actually doing a reverse now, where it's becoming cooler and better to actually purchase locally because there's all sorts of other dynamics, we'll go into that. But broadly speaking, the cheap and easy uh, area is generally Asia. So Asia is becoming very, very important for an SME in terms of finding suppliers, uh, finding customers, why not? Why should you stay here? You've got an international website and a Facebook page and social media and so forth. You can reach really the world if you have something worthwhile offering. 
the shareholders, investors, you can get somebody from Silicon Valley, if you're in the IT, you get somebody from China, even, uh, the great investors are coming in, or from Russia, from or, or South Africa, there's great new uh, ways of actually getting involved, and your employees, your employees can also be very local in this kind of global sense. So, the, the whole idea of SME seems to have changed quite a lot in this kind of area. The local content really doesn't work anymore in that sense. And there's another company that they mentioned in the same article, which <coughs> it's called Avego, and it sounds really cool. We are Avego. We operate in China, Europe, and the US. And the head office is in Kinsale. Has anybody been to Kinsale? Beautiful place in Ireland. It's got a really beautiful bay, really quiet place. Definitely not the kind of headquarter and cool center of the world. But the idea of a headquarters for our companies is really a foreign concept. It really is no longer, you know, the headquarters is, this is where the powerhouse is, is really something of the past and gradually will go out. Now, in terms of impact of SMEs, we've moved from the concept of local, from a very locally local kind of area to something that's really much, much wider. Now, it's interesting to see, and this is OECD figures, I think it was from actually a couple of years ago, but it's still fairly, fairly good. And OECD is basically high income economies, as defined. So this is the impact that they have. Uh, they account for over 95% of firms. So again, it's a lot of SMEs, as uh, you might imagine. And they account for 60 to 70% of employment and 55% of GDP. So these are some very, very important figures. And it's interesting to see how also these figures, employment and GDP, in low-income countries, interesting enough, they're not as much. So bigger companies have a bigger stake in these low-income countries. Whereas in high-income countries, they really are the most. So th I found this kind of an interesting study. I, th I thought it would go the other way around, but actually, uh, small and medium enterprises in, in these developing world are probably not as connected, not as effective, not as efficient, and they're not so much of an impact in the world. But the impact is huge. If we moved all the SMEs in our direction of being responsible and sustainable, the, the, the it's really a huge kind of change we could make happen because they employ so many people, they create so much GDP, and they also create 80% of pollution. So now the SME, nice, no. It's not that if you're SME, you're a nice organization per se. It's actually because you have no time, you're cutting edges, you're really trying. They can actually have a very big negative impact on the world that's around them. So that's why affecting SMEs is not something secondary. Whether you will be working in a big company, small company, you can have a huge effect by seeing how can we make these SMEs more responsible and so forth. And the microphone can be... Turn over. Yeah. Would you say that there's a specific sector where the SMEs are, or would you say it's something you can find in, in any sector? I'd say main. The only one that they're not present is something like energy. Mm -hmm. So in the energy area, is generally m large companies, and in the computer sector, as in hardware. So manufacturing is generally large because of the economies of scale. I'd say those that say, are there, what do you think? Yeah. Does that make sense? Is there any other area that's mainly big companies? I think those two, no? It's really manufac <coughs> manufacturing and energy. But apart from that, everything else. And even in energy, more and more companies are outsourcing specific skills to SMEs. So there's a real growth in that area, simply because the big mammoth companies are just so slow at, you mentioned it, no? Uh, multitasking, easier to communicate, is lower hierarchy. That's exactly what you need in a company. And big companies are really suffering and like going at a totally different speed. So they need this in all sorts of areas. So in terms of the impact of the SME, just like in any company, let's see at where we can make this impact. And uh, you will be writing the, the paper about your favorite uh, uh, SME. So let's start to see how your favorite SME could have some kind of impact. The organization is there, and what it does next, it's uh, the obvious, the, state, the key stakeholders are the investors, management, employees, clients, suppliers, that's pretty straightforward, that's pretty th the obvious uh, group. And then you start to think, okay, what other effects, what kind of influence can I have? Uh, we mentioned the local community, which is now quite a wider, much wider uh, kind of concept than it was before. We mentioned governments, because they can get together in unions and actually affect government and, and decision-making there. 
Uh, and the environment, for sure, that's a big area where they're really not good at, when they really need your help to actually go to a different level. But more broadly, is this common good concept. I think in social enterprise, we really went very hard in this doing good for society, but we keep seeing this trend of the importance of to maintain, to be kept alive, to do something that's really useful for society and this common good concept. So broadly speaking, when you're in the SME, I'm not sure how, how visible this was, this common good. I think six or seven of you uh, put your hands up. Uh, you put your hands up about uh, the SME you were in. How was the common good? Where's the microphone? It's gone. There. This is going to be challenging. <laughs> how was the common good concept felt in your SME? To mention names, so... Um, in a way, the common good was felt on the basis of, in, of within the organisation as far as employees were concerned, but the SME that I worked for did absolutely n had absolutely nothing to do with the community where it was based. So um, it was it, it was um, detached, de completely detached from that, and it was more concerned, um, in my view, of um, moving growing of gr more concerned with growth and and um and uh, increasing increasing profits and moving up uh, up in within the hierarchy so um tsr really was not uh, was not on the agenda so, so first of all thank god they were aiming at profits otherwise everybody would have been out of business it's a business so that's number one 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 and one priority but it's interesting to see and i think it's evident in our class it's not so evident in 99 95 percent of smes how connecting with the local community, having this common good element as part embedded in what the company does can actually provide better money and better profits. And we'll see soon how that works. And really the, the profits, and I like that you actually highlight the profit element there. But this is the quotes that I used uh, the other time, which I repeat now, which, uh, do, you, do you want to read it? Or, or, uh, whatever. Profit for a company is like oxygen for a person. If you don't have enough of it, you're out of the game. Okay, so this is really the key element, which I, I, especially as us idealists want to change and save the world, let's not forget that this is really like oxygen. The only problem is... But if you think your life is only about breathing, as if their purpose is breathing, you're really missing something. Yeah, so this is the, what is really missing from most uh, companies' mindset, and which I hope you're going to bring into companies, they have to make profit, they have to breathe, they have to al be alive. But what is life all about? Just staying here just do... I don't think so. And the company is exactly the same. It's a group of people that cannot just do... 10% increase, 20% increase. That's not how it works. It would collapse inevitably. So having this other element is really fundamental. But again, not in an idealistic, oh, how are we going to do it? Let's get practical. Let's see how this can happen. And... Let's see what happens here. Oh, yes. Could this be another definition of CSR? Do you know BITC, Business in the Community? It's very such an excellent resource if you want to see about how SMEs can impact the world. They have some really good work indicators and things. So if you want to find out more, it's definitely something I would encourage you to go and look at. And really says the sum of your activities is the social economic impact of business in the locality. So the sum of what you do is your impact. So as easy as that, as straightforward. And you can have negative impacts or positive impacts. Okay, so these are just some examples of that. So, <coughs> can I ask you, Yvonne, you were also working in, in an SME, right? Can you tell me some, what, what was it about? What was the SME about? It was about promoting exports and investment in the country. Promoting exports and investment in the country of? Ecuador. Ecuador. <laughs> there we go. And what kind of negative or positive aspect do you see that SME actually achieving? In terms of... Uh, mm. Did they create unemployment? Did they create noise? Did they create exclusion, congestion? Or did they support social enterprise, education, training? Do you see a bit of both? Do you see us more in one sense or the other? Well, I think that based on the nature of the company, as a consultancy company, they gave a lot of support to, to medium, small and medium enterprises as well, to be able to export their products. So in that sense, it was really good. Uh, but again, it was they focus on their employees. They had like uh, I think the I, I felt really good with the company in that term. Okay. They were really nice to the employees, but 
that that was it. Right. They didn't worry about the community. So there was it's good. I mean, the the, yeah. the essence of the company itself is there to promote enterprises. So it's a promoting enterprise. So there's a good yeah. place where to be. But there's different ways of doing it. Even within that, focus on employees, great. Maybe something more they could have done on sustainability, on choosing the right kind of area, and so forth. So that definitely goes there. So what decision can affect? There's so much everyday decision that can affect your, your impact was the global good, the profits and everything, the breathing and doing something else with it. So for example, where you locate and manage your operations. What SME would we like to create when we get out of this place, when we get out? I, said, I want to get out. No, it's not that bad. It's a good, very good course, by the way. Everybody will agree with that. No, but when you finish this course, what kind of other SMEs that spring in your mind that you will, might wish to start, just to get a bit concrete and not talk about airy fairy stuff. Anybody has an idea about an SME they might be interested in? You don't have to do it in the end, but just titillating your, your mind. Or one in which you would like to work in. Ah, the future is so far away. You know? <laughs> okay, let's, let's then create a, a, an SME that we would like to work in. What kind of, what would it do? Just, just, just make it a, 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 a real example. Give me, you could, you're smiling there. I'm not sure if you want to stretch our imagination. I don't know. This is very, this is very cliche of me, as my cl classmates might know, but I'd probably want to do something focusing on education and innovation in education. Okay. So, so the we got the Innova Edu SL. Based in Madrid, <laughs> it's going to be global. Of course, okay. it's going to be global, but we start from here. So, when you think about you know, setting up Innova Edu, so where are you going to be located? You can have a positive or a negative, and everybody think about this. You, you're going to now all work together with Jacob to actually create this new company, because it's just so cool, worthwhile, it's going to make such an impact of the positive kind. So, it's initially based in Madrid. Where do you choose your office? What kind of criteria do you use? to choose your office? Just my office space. Um, I want something, I'd like to be somewhere that's uh, simple and convenient for employees to, uh, to reach. Yeah, easily by public transport, hopefully. I'd like something that's uh, inspiring, something that's comfortable. Yeah place they're happy to be in, not don't feel like they're trapped in a, a jail cell or anything. This is, this is a, a um, talent catching campaign. He's, he's going to set it up. You know, it's going to be really good. Everybody follow Jacob. You already have about 25 talented employees. Yeah, I'm, employees, I'm recruiting partners. mode already. And so you just see, even something as simple as choosing your office, you can decide, I'm going to reduce pollution by having very easy, accessible, accessible to public transport. I'm going to look after my uh, employees by having something that's kind of close to where they might be. So these are just very simple things, and each one of them can be decision in, in one kind or the other. Who would you hire? Who would we hire? Let's ask somebody else to help you. Who would you hire for the Innova Edu? What kind of responsible behavior can you have? in the selection of per people to hire or the hiring process? I think you need to make sure that the person's also passionate about it. Maybe already has some experience in education or innovation, but maybe also someone who's innovated, maybe not in education, but in another field, so they can give their own ideas into the company. Excellent, so you're really not uh, holding down on this, you're expanding, you're looking for innovation for different things. What responsible behavior would guide your selection of employees, of partners of staff of human resources that's the word human resources be responsible so think of something responsible in your behavior when you're thinking of who you're going to select would you then get preference to whom well i think it's important that you have a, a, a mix in gender so i wouldn't only go for women and say okay we need to empower women or only go for men but try to have a mix in gender, but also in age. So not only saying, I think it's good to say, okay, we have to support maybe people who are unemployed and over the age of 50 or whatever. But I think at the same time, it's important to again have this diversity and also look for young people 
maybe people who have been unemployed for a while and really drive for something new. So Fantastic. I think a mix is just really important. You can start to see what kind of impact you're going to make in society by even just deciding, I'm going to get talented people, not rubbish people, talented, but where do I look for them? Maybe I can go with a young, long-term unemployed. Maybe I can really I'm find really great people. So you can see how many opportunities you have to really make a huge difference. And thank you very much for your other comments there. This Innovaedu, and we need to keep in touch to make it, make it happen. Madrid and where's end? Where are you based? Uh, where am I? Where, where Houston. Houston. Okay, Houston's good. Hot, but good. Okay, so we'll have a joint, a joint venture there. I'd like to have something like that. So you can see just how much you have, and these are just supply chain, products and services, community and social investment. There's so many things that you can do that really create excitement. At each stage, the decision made with yourself, your staff, the community around you, it's really to have these kind of dialogues that really start to create, before you, it's like the hub, before we open the doors, we already had a community of people wanting to work in there. So when we opened, boom, they flowed in, more or less. But it worked very well. So this is really the concept because you have such a great service, such talented people who really want to do good, make money and help society. You can really see the benefits of working in that kind of area. So example from your companies of positive and negative effects. So give me some more positives. We heard one here. Give me some more positives and some negatives in some of these areas. Who else? You, you said you mentioned you worked in an SME in Ar Argentina. Yes, I, uh, I worked in, in Argentina. Uh, maybe uh, a negative impact uh, for the employees is uh, working a lot of hours because of that multitasking that we were talking about. Uh, there are some things that... Uh, some tasks that there are no workers to do it, so everybody has to do them, and um, it creates a lot of of amount of work. And that has a huge impact, actually. That if I think of anything, and uh, talking for everybody in terms of the amount of time you spend in the office, it can be the best office in the world. But if you spend too much time there, your productivity goes down, the mood goes down, really does not work. So a great leader knows how to divide work, not do too much, just use what's really necessary, cut off things which are not really that necessary to really keep the hours to a decent uh, number. And we'll see a case study of a very interesting Spanish company about what they do with timing in two lessons time. It's called Soft Tonics. For people that don't have the time to see the course next time, it's a very interesting case about how they actually handle the flexi time and so forth. But that's really a very strong point in terms of the negative which you can turn into positive. Any other examples? You know, so many SMEs. You may have worked in some and not. Just one more example. Yeah. I like this row is the, is the, the premium row. I like this is like you're getting all the answers. I'm thinking about effects on the employees. And so you, in a smaller company, you have more responsibility. So you are empowered. But then on the other end, you have uh, less chances to um, get training and uh, so improve the skills and sometimes. Okay, interesting. So that's also a, a positive, but also something that we need to look into because obviously there's not so much fund. Uh, you have to get so much work done. The training is not m maybe possible. And that's where I think it's also very important. For example, <coughs> we're, we're not really an SME because we are as EBBF is an organization, it's not, uh, it's not a company, but we have <laughs> really very little resources, but at least we ask in our appraisal, we always ask our, our team, where would you like to grow? We don't assure them that we'll allow them to really grow, but at least we want to hear from them what area would you like to grow in. And we take small steps, maybe connecting with somebody we know to have a conversation or getting some external resources. So it's actually easier than we think to develop, to train people, but it starts by asking them, where would you like to be developed? And so few SMEs, we have no time, we just need to get the work done. We really miss this great opportunity of asking, what's the area, being sincere, we have no budget, we're gonna give you a big training course or another MBA like this one, we wish we can't, but we can at least put you in touch, have a conversation, send you to an event, make a gesture that shows that you really care, you really want to develop that individual. And we saw uh, in the other slides, the autonomy, mastery, and purpose concept, and really allowing the mastery of the individual to develop is so important and can be done very easily with very little budget as well. So collective impact. I'm, I'm almost losing my voice, so who's gonna read? Okay, now the, this row is over. Now we go to the back row, and they're gonna read this, uh, this lovely statement. Voluntarily, no pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Um, collectively, SMEs have considerable environmental impacts. However, given the various challenges w uh, <coughs> with which they are co confronted and the perception that their individual impact is not significant, it is unlikely that environmental concerns will figure high on their business agendas. So here we have an, a point of view. In the real world, <laughs> there's this kind of point of view. We mentioned that uh, SMEs account for 80% of the world's pollution, which is like a strong number. So when you read these statements, first, do you agree? So the statement is clear, right? So it says, considerable environmental impact collectively, but we are just one small SME. What are we? What is it up to us? And also, there's so many other uh, challenges we are confronted with. It's not really worthwhile. What do you say, um, first of all, do you agree with this kind of statement that an SME may make? We have a few nodding uh, heads. A microphone wants to be spread to this amazing middle... Uh, well I'm going to spread you guys, okay, so that... <laughs> From my experience, unfortunately, it's true. Um, not necessarily that they think they have no impact, but they use it as an argument for doing very little. And I think when you have little resources, you really do have to decide what Focus. areas you're going to impact on. But we were talking about how, how much of a difference they can make just by working in their community, working with their employees, changing their employees' daily habits. So it doesn't have to be a major global effort to change something. They can just start small with the resources they have. Okay, so you kind of agree with this, but you actually went forward, you, you offered w a way forward with that, okay? But so how many agree with this statement? Maybe not so much on a person, yeah? Maybe just flow it. Okay, for I mean, I I agree with the statement because it, as SMEs might feel small and somewhat like an individual would in the the large world we have, and they feel like personal impact is just not significant. So why, I mean, why make major adjustments and and whatnot when it really is not going to change that much? which obviously we know is not necessarily the right mentality to approach things, but there definitely is this like psychology of feeling insignificant. So I can understand the statement. And so the thing is, are you okay with this? Is what you said just now, which is, yes, true, but I'm not gonna stick with this. Right. I'm gonna go there. And I think that's really the, the what we're look seeing here is that, and I love what Anna was just said, it's not just about uh, oh, let's change the world and so forth. Let's, we are here to breathe, to have oxygen. Without oxygen, we're dead. So let's make profits. But let's also think in the back of our minds, everything that we do, is there something we can do in a positive land that really helps this, that goes in a certain way? And that's really where we want to see these things happen. So my next question will be, what drives then an SME to be responsible? We just mentioned it's small, it's got lots of challenges, it wants to breathe. <laughs> Sorry, did you want to make a comment? Sure. She did. Okay. <laughs> Whoa, we've got a lot of hands on the what drives an SME and I've got something else coming up. I think changing consumer values. Um, okay. People are now demanding these impacts and they realize that in order to compete with bigger firms, they're also going to have to be responsible. And I think because they're so closely linked to their community, they really do have to take into consideration these stakeholder needs and their changing values. So you mentioned two items here. One is uh, close to local in every sense, not just physically, but also in terms of environment. And then you actually mentioned a competitive advantage, right? So you can actually can create a competitive advantage by saying we are the responsible one, right? Some uh, some of the environmental changes uh, can impact in the like savings, like uh, because. It's n they usually think that it's about investing, but you sh actually reducing paper consumption or reducing energy, like they, they will have a, a saving in their budget. So that can be also a driver. Fantastic. I think maybe providing guidelines, guidelines to understand uh, the things they can actually do because usually these SMEs focus on what Selena said, uh, recycling paper or trying to save energy and they don't see any more impact. So maybe 
I don't know, maybe the manager travels to different, cit uh, to different cities, but they don't consider that because it's just one person. So just trying to give more information about the impact they have. And who should create those guidelines? In, in your company, you know who's going to create the kind going to get a fun uh, party going and say, OK, let's go crash the party and let's go think about what can we do and the extra things. No, but who do you think should create these guidelines? Is there an expert coming out? So we have a one of you as consultants comes out. We think what you should do is this, that, and the other. Do you have any strong feelings either way? My feeling is that what we should be doing is actually having a great time at bringing uh, this into a real fun uh, kind of activity where we give our best to really brainstorm on this. It's a great team building thing. It's just doing something different from the usual breathing and oxygen. It gives a great, uh, creates a new kind of environment between the people and you trust and so forth. So I like that we go in the kind of that direction. But I like the <coughs> The driver of it is really these kind of guidelines that you read them, I should be sticking to this, should do this or not, that really drive your behavior in a certain way. But really the, the most important driver is corporations. At the moment, realistically, uh, the majority of small and medium enterprises is going to be changing with the Innova Aid of these worlds, but right now it's a big corporation that are really changing that. So how do they do that? A voice from the front row. Uh, the good corporation can do by engaging uh, with is um, I assisting them with capacity building and aiding them with complaints, particularly with environmental standards. Large corporation can help SMI integrate sustainable development thinking into their production process and operations. Because many of these SMEs are like circling around large companies very often, and they, these large companies can have a huge influence. But also, I think as SMEs, we can knock on the door because of this competitive advantage we want to create. We can say, hey, you know what? We've got something, you know, you've got a CSR report. We can help you, small SME, to improve your uh, corporate report by doing something really cool and extra. At the moment, <coughs> the flow is big to small, but I can see these things kind of changing. And what is uh, very surprising here is the name I'm going to mention here, which uh, people say, ooh, Walmart, ooh. Actually, Walmart, to their credit, are doing lots of things, lots of wrong things. And that's what we keep saying. A, an organization has so much power to do lots of good or lots of bad, and they can decide which way to go. Now, in this case, I'm sure there's a lot we can say about the bad things it does, but it's, I just use it on purpose to say even these kind of organizations, even they, are seeing the importance of sustainability consulting. So this is actually a company, and I think, uh, well, the website, I think I mentioned on the next slide, so you can actually have a look at how they do it. They work for Walmart. Walmart has employed these kind of companies. It's not a, an internal Walmart thing. They employ companies to actually go to SMEs, because Walmart works with so many thousands of uh, small companies to really help these small companies apply sustainable processes. So definitely one career I think that you guys may, th some of you may think of, and in the other course they did, is going to consultancy, helping both the corporations involve the SMEs and the SMEs involve the corporations in going forward in this kind of area. So it's, it's very interesting to see that even these guys are really strong about this. I'm sure if we have, I think we had, um, it was as Walmart recently began, recently, this was about three years ago, uh, began asking suppliers to provide information about the social, environmental policies, programs, and performance. So even just asking a question has Innovaedu, which really didn't need any kind of push anyway, because they were going to do it anyway, has an even stronger push. Hey, even Walmart is asking me about this. You feel a bit blushed if you, as an SME responsible one, you have nothing to say to Walmart, of all people, about what you are doing on the social, environmental policy, and so forth. Anna. A microphone thrown to Anna. I think currently there's a big focus on the overall impact of products or services and the supply chains behind them. So big corporations really do have to look at every single process behind what they're bringing out to the community. And they're no longer held responsible for their final contribution, but they're essentially forced uh, to go back and then it, it also helps them if they actually help their suppliers along the way. 
Exactly. And so this supply chain concept is really a very strong one in terms of making change happen in a very practical way. And it's really a, a trend, thank God, I like these kind of trends, that goes in the right direction of going there because they are realizing the impact they have, the reputation they have, and there's so much as state that goes in that kind of area that really goes there. So it's there, it's flowing, it's happening, and on the, and there's the link. So yet there you can see how they do it. I don't want to go into too much detail in this first lesson about how they achieve this, but it's a very interesting about how they really go fairly deeply into really tapping what are you really doing as SME in these kind of areas of responsible behaviors. Um, I think uh, in, could you go back to the last slide? Say it again? Could you go back to your last slide? I, I need a... This one? Yeah. Oh, so that last line where it says they may feel overwhelmed, I think that's, I think yes, it's a good thing that th this is a trend that's happening, but I mean, in my experience with the SME, it was very small. We were four of us and I did, uh, anyway. Uh, there were there were four of us and it was very small and they they felt pressure uh, they felt pressure as well to it's a it was a tourism company and they work a lot with nature and so they felt pressure to as they have so much contact with the community do things but because they didn't have money they didn't pay me well at all so that's <laughs> that's the first thing but they didn't have money to do it in any way that was actually beneficial so it became simply about the competitive advantage so I think in, that's kind of the danger when you have these these big corporations putting a lot of pressure that maybe they can't withstand without support. I mean, perhaps I imagine Walmart is supportive, but but it, it's, a, it's a complication for for the smaller ones. And that's it's like maybe they want to do something, but or or uh, and they can't. And so they just do the marketing side of it and take advantage and undermine absolutely, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's really we talk about what drives an SME to excuse me to do something but the pressure can be good or it can be overwhelming and really be negative so the stance of the corporations but also the SME who too often just I just want the contract whatever I just say whatever the SME should be in a position and really be a bit braver about it saying I want to make this happen I see it's important I can give you some innovation in this area but you need to help me corporation give me an extra time give me an extra budget give me a resource and this is where you have these kind of external companies and if you look just in this course or in past year courses, you have so many people who just love doing this, who can give you resources, they can give you scorecards. There's so much more out there that's available. I think an SME should really focus, just like the micro uh, multinationals, on their core excellence. Have a mindset that's positive and then engage experts from outside to really do these kind of areas as much as possible, funded by the corporation or something else, selling the benefit that happens through there. That's really the ideal recipe for success. I'm driven to do something positive. Every decision I take has a positive angle to it, who I employ, where I work, and so forth. But as much as possible, I focus on my core skills and get the increasing number of people who just love to get involved with this and make change happen to really help you to get the most out of it. And to bring that innovation back to the big corporations who are actually looking for, don't forget, the big corporations have this big issue of being so slow, so needing innov innovation. You get innovation courses everywhere and they're really pathetic. But the SME is innovation itself. To, to survive, it needs innovation. So think how much you can give back to the corporation within this kind of framework. But that's a, that's a very important point, the pressure. Positive and use it in a positive way without crushing the company because that's really no good to anybody. <coughs> So this is a bit of detail, I won't go into the detail, but th they have actually a scorecard with 15 questions grouped in four categories. And it, it actually helps SMEs find an easy way to evaluate how they're doing. So in this case, what Walmart is doing is trying to take relief of the hardship of where do I start? And they really have a very simple, basic item they can really very quickly fill in. And that's really the key element to make it easy for everybody to go in that area. What else comes up here? Yes, these are the other drivers. We mentioned there are a few of them, kind of advantage, uh, being close, the fact that you're close to local and so forth. Large corporation supply chain, I said we're number one, government regulation. So depending on which country you operate, you may have a lot of pressure. Um, last year was someone from Brazil who mentioned something about waste management changed a lot and really affected how people, how small companies actually uh, change. I'm not sure, did you study anybody about the change in law in waste management? No. 
it's a bit of a niche market. But if you live in a certain place where something like this happened, then you're pushed to do a change because how that actually works. Uh, or increased demand from customers, from society, we say is very important. Or a personal wish, and actually we, we can see kind of two categories here kind of evolving. Let's see if they come up. The difference between these two groupings. One is large corporation supply chain requirements, government regulations, increased demand from customers and society in one batch. And in the other batch is personal wish to be responsible to do the right thing, eco-efficiency driven innovation. So what do you see th as a difference, the key difference between these two categories for an SME? Yeah. <laughs> um, push versus pull. It's mm. the desire behind it rather than being forced to do it. Absolutely. So one is passive. You are feeling the, which is very much the case of SMEs, you're very passive, you're very small, tiny, what can I do? And the other one is active. And as we know, the fun bit is this one. And the, oh, I've got to do it thing is that one. So this is where the real action should be, and hopefully driving and succeeding on that one <coughs> on that side as well, that really goes forward and really making things happen. And this is where the love brand, oh, I love this one at last, I got to my love brand slides, which is one of my favorite slides. This is where the like, you know, where everybody wants to be liked on Facebook and all these social media and so forth. And we're going to go even stronger where, an S where uh, any company, but an SME which is so small, really wants to be loved. So talking about love and emotional engagement of your stakeholders, my question is, why does somebody do that? After spending 560 euros on buying something, you still put a nice sticker on your car and advertise for the company, which needs no advertising at all. Why on earth do you do this? Or why do people go over the top and just fill their car with Apple uh, slash like this? So why on earth do these people, is anybody guilty? Actually, I changed mine recently. I tried to take it off, and now I've just got an E. So if you take off this bit, there's just an E left there, which kind of left it there. I cannot take it off anymore. So I, I really don't think they need my advertising there, so I took it off. Has anybody done this for companies? Oh, forget Apple. For companies, you know, put your badge there. You don't love anybody, really. Let me look at your rucksacks and things. No nice badges. I love things. No, you have no love brand things. But this is exactly what companies are dreaming of, that they spend a lot of money on your products and they still love, love you so much, they go in advertising and do these crazy things for you in this kind of sense. This is the love brand that people are looking for. So what do these stakeholders in love do? You remember the evangelists that we talked about in the, in the other lesson? People who just really love what you do and they go all out. You, they are not paid by you. They have no personal benefit from you, but they think that what you're doing, they think that Innovaedo is such a cool, that's why I want to work with you. It's such a great idea and concept that I'm going to help you and I've got no interest in doing it because it's just so great and works so well. So this is not only buy, but actually actively promotes what you're doing there. In a perfect world, you would have a five-minute break, but no, we're not going to go. We're going to drive ahead and something else. But we can stand up for one minute, okay? Uh, everybody here is really excited but needs a bit of air, so just bear with us a second. Everybody will get up-ish. <laughs> Shake about a little bit in this first thing. Oh. As we're talking about love and not only buy but actively promote, we are into active mode. Oh. And if I'm afraid the live streaming... I'm not sure how many thousands of people or two are actually watching us, but they're going to appreciate that we're going to stick to it, no break, and go for the next one for the benefit of people watching. Th sorry, but thank you. So let's look at the evolving <coughs> purchasing patterns. So again, drivers, what makes things change? Why are things changing? So whenever somebody wants to buy something, an example of an awareness you just realized that you have a need a new sweater or whatever. Does anybody have a need to buy something today, this week? <laughs> needs. <laughs> one, please, just be one. One needs. One need that you have, something that you want to purchase. I need new tights. New tights. Cool. You see, sweater, tights, that's cool. So you have an awareness that you need something. Yeah, you've got this need, which in this case is new tights. So the consideration then phase is, what will you do? You search information about various stores and options. So what would you consider now? Calcedonia. Calcedonia, for example, yeah. 
Anything else that comes to mind without advertising or? <laughs> Uh, so what's the process? I you need this? Always <coughs> go you go straight there? I always go there. I may love them. I don't know. That might be the case. Uh, okay. I think they have really great products. <laughs> so this but is this is exactly what people, what companies are dreaming of doing because usually a person has a need and awareness. You search for information about various stores, options and so forth. Then you develop a list of criteria. Okay, this is a bit more basic, but it has to be cotton, has to be this color, has to be this, has to be whatever, and that's your criteria and your preference, and then you make the purchase, okay? And the ideal company likes that answer, which says, I have an awareness, and I'll just go back and purchase for that company. I'll skip all the other bits, and I'll go straight to that company because I love, I trust, this is my company, this is where I go for. So in my case, uh, Timberland is very lucky, so anything that's not suits oriented, no, my shoes not, is Timberland. From shoes to socks, not quite. That's also because of an outlet very close to my house, that also helps. But to me, it's very easy. I need something, I need a sweater, I need a shirt, I need a... Uh, I go to Timberland and that's it. I've got a, uh, an immediate loop, so they've got rid of everything else because I love that brand, what it stands for, and it goes forward. So this is what companies are desperately looking for, seeking for, but now there's a new purchasing pattern that has arised. Is this like concept that uh, not only do we now buy, <coughs> <coughs> but after we bought, we like, we comment, we share, we ruin a reputation, we create a reputation. So this is so powerful. This is something that was not there before that is really affecting purchasing big way that any SME, especially who has not the marketing body, should really look into. So who has done any advocacy in the last month? I'll be nice with you. Who has said like to a product, to an experience? Just mention what you did. I like it. <laughs> okay. She likes something. She doesn't want to say it, so we don't want to know what it was. But she definitely <laughs> liked. She definitely liked a, a new set of ties or whatever, a photo of whatever. <laughs> but there's something that she liked there about a product or a company. So all her friends have noticed that your preference, your like, is there. So if thinking if somebody needs to do a purchase, hey, Asia just uh, mentioned that she liked that one. Maybe I should look into that. So you can see how they're really the purchasing preferences go in a different way. Please tell me somebody used your advocacy in the last month. Please. Uh, I like Nike. You like Nike? Perfect. Okay. But you just like the Facebook page or something else? Yeah. I I just liked their Facebook page and I went and, f and followed them on Twitter. So I did two things. Cool. Um, I don't know. I think for me it was uh, it's also as uh, I have other motives. <laughs> <laughs> Job seeking. Yeah, jobs. <laughs> I'm looking We've for jobs. We've got Patagonia, well. Nike. We've got by the end of the course, we know the whole list of people is applying yeah, for. Yeah. So these are some that I'm looking at. So I don't know. If that might be a motive, but I, I do like the company, which is why I'm looking for jobs with them. Okay. So. But to me, this is such a great opportunity we didn't have just a short time ago. You can create or break a reputation if you really like a company. You really, I really encourage you to not just go like, 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 but just something specific that you like about it. Make a comment, add something to really support, especially if it's a small company or something that's really, the love is there, they're doing things really right. If it's a shop, if it's a, uh, a store, if it's a product or something, really go there. It's very powerful what you can do or really slam them off if they're doing things really badly. It's very interesting. I mentioned the example of Vera Europa that I did uh, on Twitter. It's very interesting how companies are now very alert and re replying very quickly to these kind of things. And really, the reputation is very important. So you have a really huge tool there. Please use it. Like the tiny little babies, whenever I put my foot on my children, you can like those, or cats, or whatever, do. But also use it in that powerful way because you can really make a big difference there. And that's where it all happens. So yes, you have, and you will even more. So by the that should put that as one thing. Show me how many comments you've written on a good uh, uh, purchasing experience. And how do you create this emotional engagement with that company that you mentioned, we won't mention to them, not to do any advertising for your thighs, you know exactly where to go, and you go to that company because they made a promise to you, that attracted you there, and then they actually delivered on that promise. So if you want to keep it to a real basic, especially if you're a responsible company, because if you're responsible, you're going out on a limb, you're declaring you're responsible, so you better deliver on what you promise, because otherwise you break this love and there's nothing like a 
love lost relationship, you know, broken relationship. We want to go there, but you really do want to break this. You want to build the love and to consistently deliver on that promise. So it's better to promise a little bit less, but really deliver to keep that trust in the thing going forwards. As you are. First, I'm just going to defend myself, and it wasn't a <laughs> it wasn't a sketchy company. I just you know me, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, but yesterday, after we had the class and we were talking about Fairphone, I really just wanted to write all over my Facebook about that phone. I didn't because well, I don't like to share things on Facebook, but but I did like it. I like that. Um, well. Uh, it's something that I did consider doing because I think that they, I think that it's a really interesting premise that not a lot of people know about, and people always go on Facebook asking iPhone or Samsung, and I really wanted to kind of just give that option, but I have my own problems with Facebook, so. As easy as that, just expressing yourself. I said you have a, what was that uh, Seth Godin was saying, you have a social media hub. You are a social media hub. Forget the New York Times. You are the hub. For all your friends, you are the hub. You are the reference point. They trust you. They say what she says, what he says, makes sense. So really use it in whichever way you want. But this is the key element to creating emotional en engagement and advocacy, is making the promise and then delivering on that in that way. So, what is your love with anybody? You mentioned Nike, you mentioned that company. Give me in a couple of love, uh, a couple more loves, please. Love is such a beautiful world. That's uh, clean <laughs> canteen, so that's perfect, that's one. I and don't go on social media websites, but I advertise it wherever I go. Okay. So, this is a direct advertising. And why do you love it? Um, because of the nature of the so why do you love that specific uh, company? It, not just the whole idea behind the company, but exactly how they carry that out. So in the products they make, where they put the profits, uh, how they engage with the community, um, how they also uh, try to inspire other brands to follow the same path as mm -hmm. them. And when they create a community projects, they usually try to involve more companies. So rather than keeping these ideas to themselves, they try to essentially spread the message and make other companies sustainable. So, so everyone buy Clean Canteen. <laughs> Without <laughs> advertisement, other brands are available. <laughs> <laughs> but she loves that one. Just one more love. Uh, I, I want the, the last row. You, you're welcome to make any comments if you wish. The last row, some you, I'm sure you love some kind of company, organization, brand, neighbors. You have no love? You have no passion? Oh, oh, oh I'm sure you do. There's nothing that comes to mind right now. There's something, some product that you go straight for or anything like that. Nothing comes to mind, right? But it's, I think it's really important that we start to think because we can influence with our company, but also with, our, with our, ourselves to really influence how we are fed by saying, you know, really fall, <coughs> fall in love with them. I think what was interesting about what you said was you fell in love with them, not because of the nice promise, because you look any website now, any Facebook page, everybody's so... Father Christmassy is just like scary. Like everybody's wonderful. Everybody's but the how is really that's where it's really uh, happening. Is just checks and I like the way for you, Asia. You, you when the, we mentioned about the Coney video and these kind of videos, you look what's behind it. You know they make a same design. What's behind it? Very few of us, me included, actually spend the time to do this, and that's really important. But really follow through. How have they sustained this? Yes or no? That's what really makes makes a difference. And really, this is something that I, that I like as a very basic principle behind a successful company, which is... <laughs> I'm forcing her nicely to say, what's the basic principle behind a successful, responsible SME? <laughs> Having a healthy business should go hand in hand with creating a healthy community. Okay, just relax. Let's enjoy. Let's not change the world or do something crazy. Let's really try to do something that makes sense to us and to the people that work with her. So now I'm going to show you three examples, at the end of which I'm going to ask you, so you need to pay attention. The microphone stays on that table, you guys, so just, just you know your sets. Who are the stakeholders involved in the following three examples? And stakeholders, I think you know these, uh, you know what's really cool? Uh, yesterday I looked, maybe something that, I looked on Google, CSR and SME for images, and this image came up from a student of two years, two years ago, the second out of millions of things. How cool is the influence they have there? So I'm very proud that this image is now going around the world. It's not really original, but I think it's a very simple way of saying the key stakeholders in an enterprise are customers, suppliers, 
communities, environments, employees, and shareholders. This is like the basic. I'm sure there's more you can you doubt in that, no? Is that okay? Okay, they just okay. It's not so beautiful, it's just like stakeholders. So I'm gonna ask you which of these stakeholders were involved in these next uh, three examples. And who made CSR actually happen in these SMEs? Why? What was the driver? Okay, memorize all these different questions and see what happens. What's the first one? Ah, the first one is we get off to the States to visit Warby Parker. Anybody heard of Warby Parker? Yeah, one has. Just one? Okay. I, I didn't know it before I actually did this research. What's Warby Parker? And the website gives it gives a hint. Warby Parker is all about ah now leave the microphone and shout and then no. In the microphone. <laughs> Ready? Uh, Worry Parker is a glasses brand, and their idea is that for every pair of glasses given, uh, vision is given to someone who otherwise wouldn't have good vision exactly. or the ability to see. Uh, so, yeah, socially conscious brand, but all they're doing is selling glasses. Absolutely, yes. And it's similar to, the, uh, what's the other, there's a shoe company? Tom's. Tom's, that does similar things. Similar, you yeah. buy one, the other one goes to uh, uh, people in need, and it's usually it's run schools and projects like that. So this is a very basic, simple thing. And Asia, do you have a comment on that? As on you should Tom's? Uh. On this concept? Yeah, because, yeah, sorry, those, th those... Go for it, Asia, go for it. Don't just we take it as no, a No, we had, I, I don't like the, the Tom's thing because uh, they are, it's a $40 pair of shoes that is pretty much used all over South America anyway. I don't understand and in sold significantly cheaper. So personally, I have a little bit of an issue with that, uh, with the success that they've got from that kind of company. This sounds much uh, better because, well, it looks like they're focused in the States as well. Um, so the, you also don't have those transportation issues because what are they doing with those shoes? Are they flying them to this poor little child they found somewhere who probably has a pair that works better? I don't know. I find, I find it a little frustrating. Important point. So even <laughs> the best intention of a small and medium enterprise can say, hey, hold on, are you really, are you really consistent? You want to be sustainable? So why are you shipping shoes? I think they actually have production low. By the way, it's a very good point that you're making that you really need to think through and be the how you deliver. It's just much more important than what you promise. Sounds good. I buy one, one goes for free to people that need it. Ah, oh, so nice. But what really happens, we quickly find out, and it can be the boomerang that really kills the business. So let's meet the two owners of this uh, Warby Parker, and let's see what they say about, what are they going to say, about doing good and doing well. Especially if we put up the volume from the eyewear industry um, and simultaneously we're trying to demonstrate that you can build a large profitable company while doing good in the world. David Gilboa and Neil Blumenthal are the co-founders of Warby Parker, a New York based eyewear brand that distributes a pair of glasses to a person in need for every pair the company sells. Every month we tally up how many glasses we've sold and then we make a donation to one of our nonprofit partners. Uh, our primary partner is Vision Spring, which is an amazing nonprofit social enterprise based here in New York. And they train low income people in the developing world to start their own businesses actually selling glasses in their communities where most of the people are living on less than four dollars a day. Where did the idea for starting Warby Parker come from? The only reason that, that glasses are so expensive today is because there's a couple companies that really control the entire supply chain and mark glasses up between 10 and 20 times what they cost to manufacture. And so by creating our own brand and selling, cutting out all the middlemen and selling them direct to consumers, we can produce the same quality product that normally costs $500 but sell it for less than $100 to our customers. What's the biggest challenge you've come across as you're trying to maintain your social vision but also building your company? Something that, that was a concern when we, when we launched the business and wanted to have a strong social mission associated with our business and it ingrained in everything that we do was that it might scare away some investors that uh, traditionally um, only invest in for-profit businesses and, and don't really have a social bent in, in their investing strategy. Uh, but I think we realize um, as, as we built this company that having a social mission actually makes us a better for-profit business. It, it enables us to, to attract and retain more talented employees. It enables us to build a stronger bond with our customers. And I think investors saw that and saw that there are benefits to having the social mission. Investors certainly have caught on. So far, Warby Parker has managed to raise more than 50 million in venture funding. 
And after two and a half years in business, the company has distributed well over 250,000 pairs of glasses to people in need. So we just launched our first uh, TV campaign, which is really exciting. A hey, cool. So this is a concept which is slightly different in the sense, okay, they do give glasses, but more importantly, they give money to a local organization that promotes social entrepreneurship locally in these areas that need it. That makes, so it's a use, so people that cannot see can get glasses, and you're training local people to mm, start a glasses business, which is really serving them and so forth. So it's really uh, nourishing in this kind of sense. And I was struck by what they said about investments. And again, again it goes always towards my main aim, which is not either be idealistic and do good or make money. It's actually more and more investors are seeing that if you are really a responsible company, you'll have more chances of succeeding, thank God, and actually I'm going to invest in you because you're more likely to give me money at the end of this than not. So this is a big shift. First is be responsible, oh, this is going to... Uh, be responsible, this is going to be a winner. So it's a big shift, which I think is important. It started, it's not quite there everywhere. So that's case one, Warby Parker. What's happening now? Oh, you got the YouTube and <coughs> everything else. We have permission and everything else from them. They actually, they love that we actually give as much publicity as we can about what they do. Breath, fantastic. But in times of crisis, when the pressure is on, do we still remain responsible? Do we really behave in this positive way? Because that's what we're, especially as an SME, you always boom, boom, boom. Under pressure, so you want to make sure that you actually are delivering. So here we have, <coughs> <coughs> look at these elegant people. Where could we be? I'm looking at you. Uh, he doesn't look at me. Where could we be? We are in? Oh, of course, <laughs> should, with pride, he says, look, look at it, he looks cool as well. We're in Italy, you would be, with all these uh, nice looking guys. So basically, I was at, a, at an event in Rome about three or four <laughs> years ago, and I met this gentleman, He's, uh, he was actually secretary of the Young Professional, Young Industrialist Association of Italy, or something like that, and he gave a really interesting talk <coughs> about his own SME. His SME produces these things, so they're <laughs> not very sustainable, but it's, uh, they produce uh, containers, for Stadler, for big companies that have crayons. So the actual containers, you know, you say, oh, this is interesting, oh, this is innovative. There's companies that actually design these things and build them and so forth. It's based in Reggio Emilia, where as you and I know, you eat very, very well. The Reggio Emilia is a very good, if you want to go and eat well, Emilia Romagna Reggio Emilia, it doesn't look like it, but it's great for eating as well. So he w he, his company is in a relatively small uh, town, the Reggio Emilia, how many inhabitants does it have, more or less? 200,000 at most, right? So it's an SME in a very local kind of area. All the employees are local people that, that uh, live there. And uh, when he was talking, there was <coughs> it was a few years ago, uh, yeah, big crisis in, in orders, big problems. They really should have fired quite a lot of people because the money was not coming in. And his thought was, the, prof the, the orders are not coming in because uh, all the big companies are not ordering as much, there's not as much sales and so forth. So I should be cutting costs, biggest cost employees, let's move them out. The problem is, as he was walking down, up and down Reggio Emilia, he was saying hello to his employees over the weekend. So he said, <laughs> I've got to fire these people and then have to face them every weekend or every so often in the street. So this is really where the human touch uh, because of being a very local entity, really came into play and said, okay, let's do something differently. So he did not fire anybody at all in this time, but he did tell to everybody, we are in a really dire situation. These are the financials, this is where we stand, we need to do something about it. So everybody in the company, especially those that didn't have uh, much work to do, they really got creative in thinking of new models, new things, new kind of uh, brevetti, new kind of patents they could do of different boxes and really got going, really created. So I can't remember the exact numbers, but they had X, X amount of uh, sets and they just tri tripled, not just like crazy ideas, really good things. And thanks to that, over a year and a half, things slightly got better and better and better and then they got everything got back going to where it should be. So in times of crisis, instead of firing everybody, which would have been the easy thing which most companies do, let's stick to it. Now, how do you think somebody working at that company feels after knowing that they should have been fired? Instead, they used his brain in his mind to create something new, and now the company is there. 
what kind of motivational levels do they have in that company? It's a bit of a rhetorical question, actually, but <laughs> <laughs> they all want to leave now. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, it, you build trust in the management of the company. The employees feel comfortable. I mean, being able to retain your position when you know that the company's hurting. Um, but then, uh, I mean, not only that, they entrust in you the capability to improve the situation and basically uh, allow you to share input and feel like you're part of the change and making them survive, which is empowering. Exactly. To me, to me these are the, the, the second element really is not just I'll keep you and I'll be nice, but I see you on Sunday in the streets. It's really I keep you and you are a mine of gems of inestimable value. So I really think you've got the brain to get me out of it, us out of this one. And that's what really is empowering. You feel they count on you, they trust you, they count on you to get us out of the pr problem. And you really go on Monday at work and say, OK, what can we do here and what we can ha make happen? And it's really totally different. And after the crisis, you can think that people don't just stop. Okay, I'll stop now. They're in a new mentality. They will keep pushing. They will keep offering. They'll keep giving something new, and that's very important. So in times of crisis, this guy uses Italian family kind of concept and warmth and creativity to get out of that kind of crisis. Now, there's another individual, Giada Dallo. It's this one, the sister, sister and brother. It's, it's the woman there. And now, as I promised, we go to the special, my favorite, uh, Andrew. We're going to read what Giada said. There we go. Just read. You can you see yes. from there? Okay. That's, that's a good start. Uh, my first and current job is to create contracts with hotels, restaurants, and all stakeholders present in the tourism sector. From my first day at work, I, will, I always tried to be honest and transparent with my suppliers, while, of course, always trying to achieve the financial goals of my company. Even though Combining the two was sometimes a challenge. The end, uh, in the end, I was rewarded in both areas. And I like this. Uh, I always tried. She's in it, she also works in Italy. I'm just giving a bit of a boost for the Italian reputation here. Uh, so I try to be honest. Really, s it's not easy. You know, it's a struggle. It's not something that comes natural, especially when you're doing contracts. You know, big changes. Oh, can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? But she really tried to stick with it. This honesty and this transparency really something that she wanted to do. Um, this happened not, not so long ago when the manager <coughs> of a large Italian hotel chain decided to confirm a big contract with us taking away share from our competitors he justified his decision by saying you want to know what he said this is, this is such a stupid question sorry in times of economic crisis such as the ones we are living now knowing that you can trust the people that you work with is fundamental Okay, so this is a very simple, sem it's, it's an attitude. It's not that one day you say, oh, I should be honest, really, I should be uh, uh, transparent or whatever. It's really a commitment to say, oh, when is this going to pay off? It's not really nice to be honest. It's not cool to be honest very often, but she really sticks to it because of her values, whatever drives her. And you can see that in times of crisis and when this really comes out. In times of crisis, the trust in these kind of positive behaviors really come out. So the question is, originally, in case of crisis, do you still stick to your values or do you just make things happen? And I think the answer is very clear that if possible, the best way to go forward is actually this way of sticking even more than usual because people are scared and not have no reference points. They're really, really looking for somebody that makes promises and thinks about really cool sustainable things in good impact they can have and then delivers on those promises. And that's really a key factor. And now, as, as we ask, the <coughs> end row there is going to answer these uh, fundamental questions from these three cases that we... I don't want to take that out. I like the Innova Edu. So we saw three cases and the same struggle to clear the boards. Anyway, uh, so the cases were Warby Parker. The second case was... Crayon company, yeah, which boxes. crayon boxes, and the third group, well, third group, first uh, example was yeah. tourism company. SM, they're all SMEs. I think Warby Park is soon going to be expanding a bit, but at the moment it's still borderline. 
So, uh, who are the stakeholders involved in these three examples? Who was affected? The communities. The communities. Okay, so communities in all three? No. In the tourism one, no. No? In the first one and in the second one, yes. Yeah. Community, here and here. Then clients in the th three of them. Clients, yeah. Clients like sustainable, or they probably like the quality of what they do, and they also like, here they like the innovation. Wow, good ideas, new things. I'm going to become more profitable because of you making new boxes that will look really cool for my sales. And the tourism company, I, I, I can rely on you in times of crisis, so definitely that's a very important point. Who else? Employees as well. Employees? In what way at Warby Parker? They get motivated. Or Perfect. Motivation that you get from working for a cool company that's cool stuff. Yes. And you can see, I mean, the shop assistant was on camera, so I think she was a bit under pressure, but she looked very enthusiastic about what she was doing. So we like to think it's because of what happens after that or the, the whole attitude in the company that goes there. So employees really are benefiting from that. What about the crayon boxes? Uh, As well, they were given trust. They won trust. Responsibilities. And responsibility, and they kept the job, which is not yes, a bad thing to have. What about in the, in the case of uh, the tourism company? I think as well, they got... Yeah. I think it's great. It. I've been struggling at this bloody honesty all this time. Yes. At last it pays off. They get a huge contract they gave to me instead of other things. So definitely it paid off for me. Who else? I'm guessing the suppliers. Suppliers? If the enterprises go well, the suppliers are affected as well. Okay. So yeah, so suppliers for worry about like that they have success because it goes yes. forward, it goes positively. Crayon boxes. Keep the jobs. Yeah, and, yeah. and the tourism company, well, I'm not sure if it was there, but it's kind of there. Um, and why I'm going to this on a lot is in your, in when you do your own CSR case, we're going to really look at what stakeholders are. So that's why I want to make it really evident in how you can actually highlight this. Uh, shareholders, the money. Who was affected by the money people? Who? Warby Parker, were they happy, not happy? <coughs> yeah, they were happy. Yeah? In fact, they were saying, we're actually investing in you because you're a responsible company. I think we're going to make more money. So they were definitely affected. Uh, in the and crayon they boxes. they were attracting more investors due to the fact that they were actually doing social stuff as well. So they retained the workforce. Yes. They trusted it. They created new ideas. They motivated. So definitely they liked that one. In the tourist company, I guess, yes, because they got a new big contract going forward. One, two, three, four, five. And the environment, the last one, right? I'm not sure about this one. Who was positively affected there? <sighs> it's a bit more. Ooh. I don't know if it's positively positively affected because in the first one they're produce. I don't know where they're producing, but they are Americans and they're shipping the stuff to the developing world. So maybe the environment is not very positively affected. Um, but I'm not sure about it. The second one. Again, question mark. <laughs> and the tourism, if it's not sustainable, it's sustainable, question mark as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's so important. Yes. Maybe in the case of your boxes, um, you to we don't know exactly what innovative ideas they came up with, but maybe in the case of the boxes, the environment was um, positively impacted if they reduced their packaging material or if they found more sustainable ways of creating. Exactly. Things. So what, what I think was important here, we're highlighting, is not necessarily all ticks everything as everybody's perfect. You're trying to focus on some area. It's like Timberland. You know, when you buy a Timberland shoe, you feel kind of good because you say, you know, your impact has been this and that, but you've made an impact, negative. So you've bought shoes, which are now completely. So what Imbra said, we try to reduce, mm -hmm. but still we're not perfect at it. So if we don't consume anything, there would be a perfect uh, footprint. So it still is not perfect, but at least we see how important it is and how many stakeholders can be affected how by these kind of areas in this area. And then who made it actually happen? Who made CSR happen in these three examples? Warby Parker, who's uh, front row now, sorry, without an telling anybody. Ha! Ah, you thought you would get away with it. Ha! Ah, you were paying for attention. So who made CSR happen in these three examples? Warby I think, Parker. Well, in the first case, it was uh, the founders of the company. It, w it was the main idea in, in which they founded the company. And the second case I also come from the management, but it was like integrating all the all the employees in the company 
and giving them responsibility. And uh, I think in the third case, it was just an employee, the initiative of one employee. So that's r that's really very clear in terms of the impact. It's not doesn't have to be oh, it's owners. <laughs> it helps if the owners are responsible, obviously. And when we select a company or when we create a company, we find the right partners or we work with people that really resonate with us. Helps a lot. But then management, the team has to be forward, and it can be just one individual like you. Well, one individual like you that can really make things happen. So that's really the the power of making things happen. It's just not one area. And what was the third question? I forgot. Why? What was the driver? Why do you think, in this case, Warby Parker, we have to guess here a bit, I guess. Uh, we know their life story, things like that. But why do you think they decided to do that? I would say values. Values? And the fact that both of them wear glasses. <laughs> 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 that's, g that's good, because they know the issue, okay. they know the problem, and they are making money out of glasses. Say, what? how can we help the world? Let's allow other people to make money out of glasses, which is something positive, that gives sight and so forth. So perfect, so it's just both values and a personal uh, need, uh, having glasses, goes in that direction. So that's that, that, that can be a driver. In the case of the crayon boxes, uh, the need. management and the employees... The need force them to... Sorry? The need, the crisis and the need to be sustainable, in a way. So the crisis forced them, but they took a decision to go in a certain direction, either fire everybody or keep everybody. And they said to keep everybody. So what do you think could be the driver of the, and again, I'm sorry I'm asking these questions when you have no idea of the case, but just think what could be the idea of the, of the management and of the employees to go forward with that. What mm, motivates maybe them? Maybe it was a matter of consciousness. Mm -hmm. He could take the easy way, like I will fire the half of the my employees and it's done. Yeah. Or I could risk my job also and try to... My company, to my everything. So there's also a bit of courage, a bit of bravery in this area. So it's nice to be sustained, but this is the, he really took a gamble there. And the last one, the tourism company, what, uh, what was her driver? Her values too. Her values, Integrity. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I know we talk about values, value, but really that's what drives change, what makes things happen, is really the values that are yours. And knowing what they are is definitely a way to go forward. But luckily, in the last lesson, you got so many values on your back, then now you know some of your values. Do you remember all the values that you got? Hopefully it was a good experience for most of you. But you know that people value a lot of things in you and you have a lot of values in you that can drive things going forward. Now, even I need a break. So can, can, does everybody want to stand up a moment, just do a bit of uh, floaty or something like that? You are proposing some kind of exercise, Anna. S light one. We can do jumping. You can do what? What do you prefer? What wakes you up usually? Not in the morning, because uh, that's uh, three cups of coffee. What wakes you up? At least standing up, I think the oxygen goes up. One goes down, up, at least something like that. Oh, a bit of a stretch. Everybody at home, if you've been sitting for one and a half hours, it's time for you to just at least stretch and get up as well. Actually, that's a very good thing. You should do a, a one-minute meditation, or a bit of stretching, or your things, or your eyes. In my case, dreaming of... Uh, Wonderful. Much better now. Okay, so what are some of the di <coughs> direct consequences and drivers of SME efforts in CSR? One is the active area, not being passive, that really creates, it should create, but this should also be embedded in, if I think of the Nova Edu, Culture, Adinovaigdo, the integrity, the courage should all be there, should all be valued. So even if you do a bonus scheme, if you think of that, courage to do things in a certain way, in the right way, should be encouraged and so forth. So you need all of these, this kind of culture, this kind of way of being, to then create the, the public approval, you know, the love, the emotional engagement of companies like that one. Uh, it allows you to differentiate your business that's a definitely an advantage. He's the responsible. The Warby Parker stands out. They have a cool story to tell. It looks good. They do. They just had a TV program, apparently. I haven't actually seen it. But they even go into further into this kind of thing. Uh, it minimizes the risks. Because if you're a sustainable company, in general, it's well known that in general, you are looking at things in a broader perspective. You think about more things at the narrow uh, objective. And you really look forward. And it goes in a certain positive area. And it reduces costs. I think you mentioned it, that very often being sustainable means cutting energy costs, uh,
cutting production, cutting, cutting, cutting in all the bad areas, not in the employees. Uh, and that's definitely some, some areas that go there really in that, in that sense. Now, what I was going to do now was a role play because I get uh, tired of doing my own things. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how that's go <coughs> this is going to work for the audience here, but we're going to divide into little groups. Uh, there's going to be a group that decides to be employees, one environment, one community, or uh, just take three when you decide, and one group will be the actual enterprise owners. And we'll start some dialogues about being responsible in that organization. So I need uh, uh, three volunteers to be owners of a company. I'm not sure if it's Innovaedu. Let's say it's Innovaedu. Do you like to use Innovaedu as a, as a concept? So Innovaedu is education SME that in, uh, aims to create innovation and education amongst Primary and second age uh, kind of pupils. Perfect, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of SME we're going to be working on. So we need three owners. I think we have a, a volunteer for owner with Jacob <laughs> as, a, as a kind of volunteer. So anybody else would like to be the owner with him? Two, Clara and Asia. So you, can you just uh, get together and start to think in five minutes of ways in which you can be responsible, a responsible company in this area. Do I have... <coughs> Does anybody want to be one of these communities? Does anybody feel strongly about wanting to be part of a uh, group of here? Who wants to be the environmentalists? Yeah, one, two, and three. Okay, can I ask you then to join the boys yeah. and uh, just create a, a group of three and start to think about how are you going to stimulate this organization to go in that kind of direction? Uh, does anybody, <coughs> what do you want to be an employee? Sorry. Oh, everybody wants to work in a company. <laughs> Me, I want to be an employee. Uh, can, can I have that group as employees? Yeah. One, one, two, how many? You three, okay? So you're already in the same place, so it's easier. Employees, we've done. So second best? <laughs> suppliers. You're going to be suppliers. Okay. And do, do we have any... Who are we missing? Is people with the money? Any, any shareholders? Any investors? Yeah. One, two, two. You can have a small, small but very powerful investor with lots of money in their things. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'm going to leave some of you out as observers, which is just as important as anybody else. And you need to kind of yeah. tell us about these kind of uh, dialogues and relationships. Yeah, but just we want to make it as kind of quickie, mm -hmm. so uh, it doesn't take too long to go forward. So that's, that's the only thing there. I know we're missing community. Who cares about community? We only serve in the community. <laughs> we're shortcutting here. That's exactly what the SME should not be doing. So you now have four minutes to think about in your different roles, how you're going to do it. And then you, each group is going to be presenting their case to the <laughs> owners who are going to listen and propose and see what happens there in the dialogue. And then we'll see what a real stakeholder dialogue will look like. I'm see? going to join the stakeholders. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> you can join a group if you want to or just wait, whatever you prefer, <laughs> you prefer to do. You're a shareholder. So just... Hold a dialogue.
Okay, it will not be perfect, but let's start the first of the dialogues between the owners. Who wants to go first to uh, enjoy a stakeholder dialogue with the owners? We have a logistical issue with the microphones, so uh, can, you, can you come? Microphone range is like this, right? Like that. So can the first stakeholder, you're the first stakeholder? So the stakeholder, who are you? Introduce yourselves. Hello. <laughs> uh, we are the suppliers. Uh, we are um, the, the company that designs the online platform for the training uh, education program. What is, let's have ah. a dialogue. Okay. What we've, we've talked about uh, what we would like um is uh, a good contract and uh, also to be uh, told like have the possibility to dialogue about the product that you need and have the the requirements everything like with clarity to for us to develop um and we actually like a direct channel to the customers to the clients so if you could organize a meeting not just with the owners but also with the other stakeholders um would like to hear more about what, uh, yeah. what they need. Yeah, and you would like to hear more about specifications you need from us and more about the idea of the, of the company in order for us to give you exactly what you want. And the, um, to respect the timing of uh, production for us and also uh, to be um, respect the timing in the contract for payments. Okay. Dear owners, what do you, what's your... Let's have a dialogue. What's your reaction? Did you have any ideas originally about how to do what to do with suppliers? Uh. Well, <laughs> good, good afternoon, <laughs> suppliers. These are our specifications, and we don't have them. Yes, these are our specifications. We hope that we hope that they're very clear. I mean, we we obviously we need there to be open and transparent dialogue between us. Actually, that's one of the values that we that we were discussing that, that we think is, is important for our company is, is, as you say, having that open dialogue between both, uh, not both, between everybody, including yeah, ourselves as, as owners, um, as suppliers, as well as customers. So our, we were hoping as well, with your help, we could do this, have, have a, make a platform in order to communicate with everybody, because it is something that we're, we're, we believe is a good idea as well. And I'm going to pass you along too. And for us it's also important that our relationship is built on, on trust and openness. So whenever you need something, you have to tell us because we don't really know what your needs are. So this is one of the important things we also want to stress on, that we actually be honest to each other and um, yeah, have a close communication. And one thing we would like to include in our contract is, um, because we want this open dialogue with the customers as well as you, is we uh, want to be protected essentially so that our in the intellectual material we're providing um, isn't in danger of uh, property theft or anything. We were wondering if you could supply us with some sort of protection mechanism. Yeah, I think that goes back to what Clara was saying that uh, part of building healthy relationships is, is gaining trust. So whatever uh, mechanisms that need to be in place in order to do so, such as uh, intellectual property safety uh, uh, mechanisms or whatever the case may be, of course, would be cared for. But yeah, I think we can all agree that many of the things you've mentioned as far as clarity and um, trustworthiness and respect um, for the supplier and then also you all do, you doing the same thing in our direction is is clearly healthy for uh, the relationship and the channels in which we do business fantastic so a big applause for this uh <laughs> so uh, a couple of uh, observers what did you observe what was your observation how was the dialogue i realized that um 
the next the group the next group is what's the next I realized that the company wanting to give back to the community will give them a long dividend at the long run because it's the amount that they're going to spend in advertisement and publication it will I mean, it's better and it will benefit them because advertisement and publication is nothing without doing good to the community that you're operating from. Absolutely. In terms of the dialogue dynamics, how were the dialogue dynamics? Was it a dialogue? Was it a dialogue? Were the suppliers responsible? When they're responsible, were they pushing? Were they asking? What was the feeling? It looked like an open dialogue where both parties were listening to each other, and um, the feeling is that when you um, build a relationship on trust and, and transparency, both parties can benefit, so it's a win-win. Right. What struck me was that the suppliers were actually demanding a lot of the things, and the owners were very happy to meet those, and it was like a dialogue. I think that's an important thing to also have, is that as suppliers, say, oh, I'm a supplier and it should be nice, but not necessarily. You can guide. And what was interesting, actually, they were pushing for more. They were saying, can you give us more ideas? If you have suggestions, don't be quiet, tell us. And that's so often a problem with, with uh, suppliers. Um, and that, uh, we'll talk about that later. That's really very interesting that how you actually pulled that out. So it was excellent. Do you have another comment? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much for that. Now we have another group of stakeholders that comes in. Let's see what this uh, stakeholder dialogue evolves with this new group. We're talking with the... Environmentalists. Environmentalists. Yes. The tone of his voice already starts to sound a bit threatening. Yeah. We are the uh, environmentalists. <laughs> Good afternoon, in Nova Edu. Uh, we know your activities don't have huge impact on the environment. However, we believe that you can uh, tackle some issues, as you are very innovative. We believe that you can educate your students on sustainability issues. What do you think about this? I think our, the main target of our company, if I get it right, is that we have innovative ideas around technology, how you can educate people. So it's not so much about the topics that we educate, but more about the, the technology, actually. But I still think that there will be maybe possibilities to um, include the environmental issues. And I think another issue could be, I mean, we will set up a headquarters somewhere, and I think it's also important for us that we take environmental issues into account there. I think it's a good, definitely a good idea. It may and maybe we may not have such an effect with our our end user. I mean, focusing on uh, younger children and students, but we could definitely be a leader in the field and maybe show other companies, for example, how to approach sustainability issues and be an educator in this way. Um, so. I, yeah, though it may not be so easy to, to teach uh, sustainable environmental practices to our students, even though it, it might be possible, maybe we could be a thought leader in the field and show through action rather than uh, our words. Is that an idea? Um, and then I would just like to say, I mean, uh, we, as, as uh, Clara said, we're, we're more involved in innovation and, and education as opposed to the environment, and, and that's your field of expertise. So as we were saying earlier, we do want to have this platform to, to have contact with everybody because we know that we don't have all the answers. Uh, and we, we would like to encourage uh, um, ideas from your sector. I mean, there's this, actually, there's this really cool company called Black Box uh, Laboratories that's, that's aiming to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, to reduce paper usage, so we're, we might even work with them. So I mean, we're, we're welcome to all, we'll welcome all ideas. Uh, and one one thing, I, I would just rather ask a question to you is what what type of practices would you recommend for companies such as us from an environmentalist perspective? So. Uh, what we believe really is that education is a basic uh, form of teaching uh, children since they are little and in their growth process and education process how to be how to care environment how to be sustainable so for sure what we are expecting is that your your physical place also allows uh, that the ex these practices can be developed such as recycling and use of water and environmental protection so maybe 
through is not just telling them what to do, but giving them the space to practice these uh, good habits in environmental care. Fantastic. Thank you very much for this uh, exchange as well. So observers, what do you see? What do you see in this? Uh, the environmentalists came in very aggressively. I am the environmentalists, and then they kind of mellowed out a bit, which is interesting. What do you think? Um, I think once again, uh, yeah, they started off by making their position quite clear. Um, on the side of the company, um, obviously, um, there as being an educational company, awareness is a very important. Uh, important aspects of the work they do and they also mentioned um, logical things that they would take the environment into account um, within their buildings etc which is quite interesting probably the thing that struck me most is that they said that they admitted that they didn't have all the answers to solve everything um, so they weren't um, making any unrealistic promises which i think is uh, um, which i think is important and uh, also showed that they were willing to cooperate to learn um, uh, with with whomever in order to in order to improve themselves, so I think it was good. So everybody really gained here by having this level and analysis. The one thing, obviously, it's a very short exercise. One interesting with the environmentalists. Okay, then we have six month reviews to check how you're doing. Is a good way to keep the momentum and so forth. But obviously, you did a great job in terms of bringing in the ideas and the and the things and such a good thing. So fantastic there. So definitely positive. Who's the next uh, stakeholder that wants to engage with this lovely group of owners? <laughs> it's just the, ca the, the microphone issue, unfortunately, so we, we need to talk into a microphone and go forward. No, please, please, you're, part of, you're an employee. All employees need to be involved. You're the employees, right? Okay, so all employees must be involved in this conversation. <coughs> right, how the owners are feeling more and more comfortable. They sound a bit edgy now. They say, oh, I like this. They're becoming more, I'm the owner. Good. No, this <laughs> Gabby, employees. Yes. Exactly, no, no, that's no. a good one. We are um, postulating for being employees. Yes. We are professionals right now. Ah. <laughs> yeah. We're really like professionals. Level is really up here. Okay. So um, we want to work in a really meaningful company that, we, that with a lot of values that can lead us to do something really good for society. And we believe that you have that in your core business, that's why it's Innova Edu. And we love um, <laughs> being with kids and helping them to empower them so they can be really good persons in the future. So you have, if you have more requests? Well, we wanted also to tell you that since you are Innovative and an innovative enterprise business, whatever education mm, enterprise, whatever. Um, we <laughs> want <laughs> to have the responsibilities and not to be fixed to uh, determine the specifications, but flexibility within our jobs and being trying to move forward all together mm -hmm. while having the social benefits that you might provide us. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think from the uh, ownership standpoint, we too agree that um, less hierarchy and more flexibility between the employees and staff and ownership, everyone, I think putting us closer to one playing field is nice because um, you, we, we don't, we wouldn't hire you if we didn't think that you add value, that you're innovative in creative thinking uh, does something to change us. So, I mean, of course, I, w I agree with you in that regard. And then uh, to answer you, I obviously people who share our values are clearly the, sh the strongest people we could ask for. And uh, being in the position I'm in, I don't think I should project down upon anyone. I think I, I should hire people who are smarter and more uh, active than I am because uh, if I can't solve an issue, wh why would I not want someone who is smarter and uh, value-driven and innovative to uh, tackle something that I I would have a problem doing myself? So I think, of course, 
sharing these values on uh, combating, uh, I guess, I don't know, stagnation in education uh, is clearly a goal that we share. And so sharing that goal and that vision is important. Totally agree. Um, <laughs> and as you know, we are an innovative company, so we want to enhance this innovation. But for us, it's also important, we mentioned our values before, that we want transparency and, and trust. So for us, it's important that you come actually to us if there's a problem, if you yeah need maybe other working hours, whatever. We really want you to be open to uh, with us, so we can be open and actually help you because this is like one of our core um, yeah core values that we actually create something together and not try to work against each other or try to yeah. So I think this is like our goal should be the focus. It's all about team here. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything to add, owners? I mean, I th yeah. My concerns were addressed by my colleagues. Um, I'm really glad to hear that. <laughs> my concerns were addressed by my. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, uh, we have, uh, dear observer, we have three employees. Is there something, by the way, congratulations for how you handled everything, how we want to work in your company. Um, <laughs> Is there something that could have been improved with the three employees involved or not from the owners? It's a small detail which probably is not so important if you think about it in this quick exercise. What I noticed is that two people talked and the third one didn't. And these are your uh, human resources. So you really want to hear all three of them. It's a theoretical exercise, you did great. But I'm just saying when you have three people together, you really want to hear all three, not the loudest, in the nice sense, not the most. <laughs> so far. You really want to make sure everybody comes out and really sticks out. So that's a very important, especially, but in any kind of meeting, you really would ideally want to involve every single people's person sitting around the table, and that's just 25, and that's a bad meeting. With 25 people around the table, you don't want to have that. But as much as possible, more involvement would be ideal. I think to critique myself, uh, I think one thing we could have done is pose a few more questions in both directions to try to create, basically do exactly that, create more dialogue between more people around the table. So I think it was very good, open. Yeah. You listened carefully. They were really paying attention to what they were saying. You really replied to what they were saying. There was a real understanding. You underlined the company's values which I think was very good. So you know, here transparency and trust are the important things. We want to happen, come back to us, it's an open door. So I think it was very, very well handled. And you will have these interviews soon. Uh, and it's just so important to state what's important for you, which is a salary probably, which is things. Mm -hmm. But you really want to state what's really important for you. You'll be spending, not the rest of your life as we know, because you'll be changing four or five companies, but you'll be spending a few years, hopefully, in that next workplace. Choose it rightly, ask the right question. What's really important to you? Is it transparency, is it dialogue, is it uh, appraisals? Whatever it is, really say it openly because they may not take you, but you may not want to work there. Because if they don't agree with the basic fundamental what's important to you, that company is not for you. You're gonna hate every Monday you go into that company. So it's better to just postpone your next job by six months, one year, but have the right job. So think through this interview process, not just uh, yes, I can do this and the other, I can make everything, but I would like, not I want, to me, what's important to me, if you want me to thrive, what's important is that kind of dialogue is really important what you do, but great work. Last but not least, the money, shareholders. El último, no, shareholders. So... Hello. <laughs> Clarification, are you, have you already invested in InnovaEdu or are uh, you thinking of investing? We want to invest, you but we want to make investors. some arranges, arrangements first. <laughs> thinking about it. Yes. So as like, like I said, we are thinking about investing in your project because I think it's important to share the same values just like the employees. Um, of course, we want profit <laughs> out of this investment. Uh, but as, as we're going to 
be part of the decision making process, I think it's important to consider that uh, we want uh, clear objectives. We want to know how this money is going to be spent. So we are asking for transparency and communication and a relationship, obviously. And I think that's it. I don't know if you have anything else to say. We'll let them talk. No, you go first. And then we'll, we can no, also, because we are not only all about the money, we also look for social impact and we want to have like measures or something yeah, measurable that we can relay on to see if our investment is not only giving us return in money, but also impacting the community. Yeah, but also the money. <laughs> also <laughs> money. <laughs> yeah, I... You guys are so lucky to have these kind of investors. On yeah, the these, are, Amazing. these are really great investors for our company because not only do we share the ambition to to make a little bit of money along the way, but to make a significant social impact. So I'm happy that you were the type of investors who are looking to share some of um, your resources with us. But to answer kind of your concerns, I think, of course, being transparent and showing um, how money is being spent and then also being very clear and um, showing the impacts that are being made socially, environmentally, um, it, I think we owe it to the shareholders. I think not only do we owe it to you, though, we owe it to our suppliers and our employees and every other stakeholder as well to uh, be very clear and transparent in, in this regard. So, um, yeah, I thank you for having such concern, and I, I hope that you would hold us accountable for that. Thank you, Jacob. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Jacob me mentioned a lot of a lot of really important points there. Um, but you know, as uh, as you said, I mean, you, we we come from the same values. So um, I guess it's it would be interesting for us to know as well if if, if yeah, monetarily monetarily you're you're interested in in investing in social projects, but. Um, do you, how do you, how would you see our, our relationship furthering the, uh, 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 aside from that? I mean, uh, how often do you think you'll be able to come and, and see the impacts if, if that is something you're interested? Is that something that you might want to do? Or, I mean, we'd love to involve you because obviously it comes from the same place as where we're coming from. So um, if, and, and you know, in the end of the day, we all need to make a little bit of money because what's the point in, if we can't, then the social impacts will stop as well. So I think we're really on the same page here, and, and hopefully, hopefully you want to support us more than just monetarily and become our partners. Oh, I, I guess that's what I meant when I said like being part of the decision-making process, because we want to know how the money is being spent, with, because we want to know that the goals are being achieved, that the social value is being added, that people are getting educated. So for us, it's very important. Uh, the money, of course, but also what we're going to achieve. So I think uh, we're going to take part as much as we can. And hopefully everything will turn out as we want to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fantastic. The nicest possible shareholders I could think of and dream of. Thank you very much for existing. And you can see this is uh, where we... On the, in the last class, we mentioned about this uh, <laughs> new communication dialogue, which is not a monologue, when it's a dialogue. And this was such a beautiful way. You could say, oh, this makes sense. Everybody walks out with satisfaction. They're not asking, they're not offering things that are outside, you know, wow, this is really crazy. It all makes sense. But I, I wonder which ones of you working in SME have these kind of dialogues. Very easy to do. It doesn't seem to be a problem. I see people say, whoa, are you crazy? It never happens. See how unreal and, uh, and, and strange the real world is and how the real world we're going to create is going to be so much more logical and sensible by simply dialoguing. Male-female dialogue, Jacob is a perfect example of a male, 100% male, but with a very <laughs> dialogue of, 
We're very dialogue oriented. The thing you say, oh, it's more of a female characteristic. It's a woman dialogues better than a man. But no, this is exactly what we were saying before. It's not like a man is like this and a woman is like that. It's really the ability to understand, to empathize, to go deeper, to be practical. So it's not a man or a woman thing. It's a, m a combination of male and female mentality that needs to be part of this. And uh, <coughs> very important. So we'll skip this because we're at the end of the class. Uh, but really also interesting is the uh, dialogue as a source of information and understanding. And it's, um, I had uh, uh, an example of a friend of mine who was at Iveco, which is not a small company, but they have sm SME as suppliers. And this supplier was working really, really hard to deliver always by the 30th of the month. And Iveco was going wild every time because that really disrupted their flow. They didn't want that stuff by the 30th, they wanted that stuff afterwards. So small supplier, running like a maniac to deliver by the end of the month, Iveco really does not want that stuff there. And that went on for almost one year until she came up and said, but why don't you talk with each other? So they actually had a conversation, really basic, this happens every time, they actually, with the small supplier, the big Iveco saying, take your time, we really don't want you to start by the 30th, we want it on the 15th because it's a different kind of flow. But there was no dialogue there. Look how much dialogue there was here, zero dialogue there because we don't have the time and so forth. So a, a problem for the small enterprise and a small a problem for the big enterprise was solved by simply saying, hold on a second, do not deliver so quickly, <laughs> take your time and do it for us. This is the importance of dialogue and how much you can learn and it was beautiful to see how much you as owners learned from the different stakeholders you actually interacted with, which is fundamental. <coughs> uh, okay, we're going to skip all of these and we're going to go quickly to, oops, I just was gonna just want to show you how uh, this, for example, Phenomics, this company, this, uh, this CEO, not only in the statement says, I want to boost our company's performance within the next five years, which is pretty obvious. They say how inspiring our employees hope in the future, <coughs> in their careers as well as their personal lives. The concept of fairness, motivation, very much like Inova Eduk. So he has this in the statements and so forth. And these are the numbers of this company. Okay, so they're as SME, but in a number of markets. So these values, this attitude of getting uh, results by that way gives you these kind of results. And they actually won the Wall Street Journal, best small workplace to work in, in the US. In the US, there's a lot of small enterprises, but they were amongst the top 15 companies nationwide because of this. So it's recognition, it's numbers, it's everything. So it's just like common sense, as long as you've got leaders like yourself that really put that common sense in a company and make it go forward. And my last question here was, which is the first stakeholder of all of these you would involve in your SME in a CSR activity? What's the first stakeholder you would involve in? Depends on the business, but most people I think quite rightly say employees, because basically employees are the people that are in direct, no more, in direct contact. They are the people that will deliver the promise or not deliver the promise. So that's really where, where this really will work and, and go forward. So we close this at two o'clock on the, on the dot. So you have plenty of time to think about the, not too much, but on the ideal blog post. By the way, the blog post he wrote, I didn't read all of them in detail, I read most of them. I was wowed by the kind of th things he wrote. It's not so much the length, the things and the ideas that came out from the class were really very interesting. So, and I will share them with all of you so you can have a <coughs> look at them. Definitely worth reading. So thank you very much for the effort you make on this. So that's one. The short document, same as the last time. We're looking for an SME that has applied CSR ideally world coverage, so from your area, from your where you are, are actually based. The driver that pushed the company to go into CSR, the stakeholders, it has positively influenced, and as always important, and we we'll see that in the next lesson, how to quantify, so oh, they were good, how good, what kind of indicators they had. So within that short one, two pager format, which is fine, please try to include these, and I wrote to some of you, wrote me some parts which missed some parts of the other, really important, the, the ideal thing gets uh, the top marks and the 10% attention, which I'm gonna drag you in. From now, the microphone is gonna be going backwards and forwards and going there. As always, I leave you with, by the way, if you want to come to an EBBF conference, plug, it's in May, but I leave you with this uh, quote, which, who's gonna read? Somebody who's never spoken before. Where's the microphone? Gabriela, ven aquí, ven aquí, dino, cuéntanoslo. Go for it, we have a beautiful <laughs> voice. No, this is the inspiring last quote of the things. Go for it. 
The volume of your impact is measured by the direction of your movements, the passion with which you inspire and the attitude by which you make an influence. Okay, so it's all up to you. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on Friday.